Hi, welcome uh, everybody. Delighted that you could uh, join us uh, this evening. My name is um, Joe Hall. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement for this discussion between Joe Sacco and Glenn uh, Coulthard. I just wanted to begin by recognizing that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, also wanted to uh, thank the uh, sponsors for um, this event, including this is co-presented with the Heart of the City Festival. We're uh, proud members of the Downtown East Side community and great to be uh, working with them for the 10th straight year. I want to thank SFU Library, SFU School for Contemporary Arts, the Community Engaged Research Initiative, and also Massey Books, who are selling books outside in the cinema. And uh, uh, also right after the uh, event, there will be a reception in the World Arts Center on the second second floor where Joe will be available to sign some books. We'll have a cash bar and some food um, as well. So I ask you to please uh, join us uh, there um, as well. Um, uh, both uh, Glenn and Joe are not strangers to being uh, in this space. We did the uh, book launch for Glenn Coulthard here back in, I believe, around 2014, and Joe's been here a few times uh, before. Um, Glenn is Yellow Knives Diné, an associate professor in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies Program and Department of Political Science at UBC. He's the author of Red Skin, White Mass, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of, Rec uh, Colonial Politics of Recognition. Joe Sacco is a Maltese-American cartoonist renowned for his long-form graphic journalism and field work in conflict zones and places where people are facing displacement and dispossession. He's the author of numerous books, including Footnotes in Gaza, and a, a book that I first read of his back in 99 or 2000, Safe Area Garajda, but a, a great body of work. Really joy to have you both with us today. So please join me in welcoming Glenn Coulthard and Joe Sacco. This work. Oh, wow. <laughs> it does work. Um, so we've just kind of, um, we're going to frame this as a conversation. And it's obviously to get into uh, Joe Sacco's wonderful new, uh, or one of his newest books, uh, Paying the Land. Um, but also a little bit of the creative process and, and issues that uh, sparked you to, to write this, uh, this book. Um, so I just wanted to ask you straight out um, is if you can explain uh, what inspired you to write it, how it relates to um, your other your other uh, uh, journalistic and and um, artistic practices, and um, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, uh, pleasure to be on stage with you, Glenn. It's a real honor uh, and lovely to see you all here. I haven't been in Canada for a while. In fact, this is the first time. I've been here since the book came out, so. Um, I think I wanted to do a book that was about climate change. As, as broad a topic as that is, um, like everyone, I'm, I'm interested in, in the topic, and I thought it would be interesting to do a book about where, where things as, in regards to resource extraction happen. And they happen on the peripheries, and often it's indigenous people who, are, who suffer from resource extraction or have to deal with it, let's say that. So my original idea was kind of, um, it, it was a little shaky in a way. It was, I wanted to do a comparative study between indigenous people in Canada, indigenous people in South America, and maybe indigenous people in Australia or India. So I thought, okay, I'll start in Canada because that will be the easy place to go. Uh, people will speak English. Uh, it's not so far. Um, and that sort of brings me to the other reason I wanted to do this book. Um, I wanted to get away from violence. I wanted to get away from drawing conflict, uh, drawing the AK-47 rifle, let's say. Um, and I thought, okay, I'll just go up there and talk to indigenous people. And what I found out is you cannot get away from violence. Um, I, I really went up there with, um, let's say, once I, I launched myself at it without really knowing as much as maybe I should have known. But that's sort of true with all my work. And when I got up there, I found, you know, I, I learned, I, I'd known about the residential schools but I didn't understand what it meant to the people, and I didn't understand the sort of violence it meant for the people. And so I found, I, I ended up doing a book that was 
um, unfortunately, and, and from, from my regard, because I wanted to get away from violence, was a very, to me, a very violent book. Um, so that's sort of it. I, it started out as a, a book for a French magazine, or sorry, as a, as a magazine piece, like 60 pages. I went up one time. I didn't feel like I really got my finger on it. And so I went up a second time and realized, oh, this is, this is about violence. It's about colonialism. It's about a lot of things I didn't really understand as well. And so I sort of gave up that comparative study idea I had and just said, I'm just going to concentrate on this. This is, there's a lot here. Um, how do you see, like you've talked a little bit about how, um, how, you, how you initially wanted to move beyond the question of violence or conflict, but what, what really kind of, um, like this, you say that it's, it's, it, it continues but in a different form in, 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 the, in the book on the North. So I'm just wondering if you can explain, explain that a little bit further. Well, I mean, essentially, if you want to boil it down, uh, in the United States, violence against indigenous people was the cavalry charge. And in, in Canada, violence against indigenous people was the school, as you know, as you, as you well know. Um, when I first went up there, I mean, I don't know how to put this exactly, but there's sort of a, there are people who, know, let's say white people who know a lot about indigenous people who are very sympathetic, but in some ways they, they're a bit gatekeepery. And what I was told was, don't ask about residential schools. And I sort of listened to some of that advice, and especially on the first trip I was careful not to really broach the subject, but what I realized, it was there in the room anyway. Some people just brought it up in conversation about when they were in residential school and what happened to them. And then I just sort of let myself be myself and say, so are you willing to talk about that? They said, of course. Uh, some people a bit less so. But um, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to a number of people about it, and to me the revelation sort of came when I talked to Paul Andrew about it, because he specifically knew I wanted to hear about residential schools. Paul Andrew is, is the first character I bring up in the book. He knew I wanted to talk about it, but he started out talking about life in the bush. And to me that was like, oh, now I know how to write this book. I know how to start the book. Because he, in a very gracious way, just explained what it was like to grow up as a, a young boy in the bush, how people, um, how communities developed around these sort of family units, how people, he understood his place, he learned by watching, uh, and the cycles of people's lives with the, um, with the animals and with the weather. And it was such a beautiful story. And then at some point I realized we had to get to that point, and that's where I, I asked, so, we need to get to the point where the plane shows up because what happened to him is a, a plane showed up. His parents had to put he and a couple of his brothers on the plane and then they were flown away. So um, that story to me was pretty, pretty affecting. Um, and I realized you had, I had to show what life was like in, in sort of the best way because he had a very, he, he loved telling that story, I think. Mm -hmm. He loved that life, and it, it was, to him, the best of what he, of the Dene for him was that period. So um, I realized I need to show that so I can show how things have moved on because of the residential schools and other, other things that have gone on in Canada. Uh, maybe if you could just uh, provide, uh, I don't know if it's a synopsis or whatnot, but like a... Um, like, uh, like just the gist of the story that you tell, because it, it goes through a number of stages. It's like, it, it starts off grounding the land in that certain sort of way, uh, both pedagogically, but also in terms of storytelling. And then it gets into the resource extraction, but then it kind of backtracks into, into uh, a history of Dene land struggles. So, so um, maybe for the audience, it, it might be useful just to, 
to give the that the yeah the elevator pitch of, of what right. you were doing. Oh, the elevator pitch. Um, hmm. I don't know if it's an elevator pitch. It'd be a long elevator ride. Let's say it's the up to the Empire State Building. Uh, basically, the story starts out with Paul Andrew talking about um, uh, life in the bush, but. I was going up there with a woman named uh, Shauna Morgan. Uh, she's from Yellowknife. She was kind of my guide. She knew a lot of people um, in the communities. And we went up there and we got to Toledo. And this is, you know, I go in with, uh, with stories with a lot of preconceived ideas. And this, as stupid as it might sound, I sort of thought, well, indigenous people, they're against resource extraction. And it was simple in my head. But when I got up there, I realized there was a lot of disputes within communities about how far they should go, uh, what it meant. Always, always framed with, well, we need to put the land first, no matter what, uh, what side they fell on. But I got into some of that. I, got in, I get into sort of a dispute within a community um, about that sort of thing. Uh, I, I, I talk about what the history of uh, resource extraction in the Northwest Territories, which which starts with the Hudson Bay Company and and the furs, and how really what it came down to it for Canada, it seems that Indigenous people in the Northwest Territories didn't matter because um, the land wasn't good for agriculture. Uh, it it wasn't your typical settler place, except when they found gold and oil suddenly the land became very important and the indigenous people had to be removed from the land but also culturally removed from the land because if you want to if you want to control the land you have to control the people who are, that live there so i begin talking about land claims i go into a lot of land claims there's a lot of detail but i think it's necessary to understand how that works and how colonial structures still work uh, against indigenous people to continue to dispossess people and how indigenous people have to work, seem to have to work within these Western structures to, to get anything. But that sort of goes against their own, I think it goes against their own way of thinking of things. I talk about a couple of, uh, I talk about sort of the history of the, uh, the politics of, you know, from the Indian Brotherhood on and then I get into the residential schools because it's clear that things seem a little unmoored in a way. Culturally, a lot of people seem unmoored from the culture. And then I have to get into the residential schools. I sort of wait till the middle of the book um, to sort of place that. And then I go into what happened in the residential schools through a number of people's eyes. And then yeah, finally, I get I, I go to Trout Lake, which was just this beautiful community where a lot of a lot of the themes of the book are represented in that one chapter about one particular community, because they there's there was sort of a let's say a dispute, a philosophical dispute between Trout Lake and a neighboring community with whom they had a lot of ties called Fort Liard about whether they, whether they should go ahead with resource extraction because there's a very large natural gas deposit under that land. And one community is very hesitant. The other community, at least the leadership structure, was kind of gung-ho. So, and it, it ends with talking to some younger people who, who have an, another, they're trying to reclaim something um, and, uh, and try to see how they can move forward, basically. I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, Glenn. Yeah, no, it just, I think it's helpful for, for people to know what, what you were doing. I, got uh, the sense well I know a lot uh, like a lot if not most of the people who who you chatted with for for the text and I know that um, um, they're often um, not all that forthcoming <laughs> in terms of sharing this type of uh, knowledge or history so I'm wondering if you have any um, uh, stories about how you were received um, in in uh, these northern communities and and um, how how willing they were to to share their stories with you? Well, we're talking about people who have been kind of over researched in a lot of ways, and uh, people come through all the time, and uh, 
I mean, let's say they, they extract knowledge from uh, indigenous people. And then the, the complaint I heard from indigenous people was, what do we get out of it? You know, people come here, uh, they do their PhD dissertation, they go and make a career out of it. And what about, wh why, have we, why have we engaged? So it can seem sort of exploitative. Um, But maybe through good looks and charm, um, I managed to sort of work my way into their good graces. But it went in different ways. Sometimes it really surprised me. Like, uh, Paul Andrews is a very serious guy. And then to sit with him, he just graciously gave this story. Stephen Kakfui, who's a who became premier of the Northwest Territories at some point, was a real militant. I tell his story. He started out as a militant who wanted nothing to do with dealing with the Western uh, structures at all. And in the end, he felt like the elders were pushing him into dealing with them because they needed someone to deal with, with those structures. Um, I, I showed up at his door at, in Yellowknife and he tore me a new one, basically, <laughs> because I had got, I really wanted to talk to him. It was really important that I speak to Stephen Kakfui. And uh, Shauna, the, the woman who was kind of my, my guide, was calling to, to set up the interview. And every now and then I'd say, did, did he respond yet? So i call him again. And it's, he, when I met him, he said, why was she always calling me? You, you just been, you got, you're on my nerves. And I was like, oh, wow. I said, okay, I'll go. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I understand. It was me. It wasn't her. And they said, oh, just come in, come in, come in. So we, we came in and we sat down and suddenly it was a, like a different thing. Because I think I asked the right question. I, I, asked him, I asked him, what politicized you? And suddenly he was like, okay. And by the end of it, he was just, again, just very gracious. But I think people are wary in a way of who you are. And I think they have every right to be wary. And different people responded differently. Yeah, uh, Kakfui can be a prickly pear. <laughs> um, is this going to be filmed and um, <laughs> yeah. going to see it? I really, I really enjoyed him, I'll say that. Um, it, um, I guess, like my own work, uh, as we were talking over, over a drink earlier, um, looks at like the international struggles that kind of informed a significant uh, point <laughs> Um, or a period of time in which uh, you look at the Dene land struggles, land claims, and their relationships uh, with others. And I was wondering if you can, if, if that surprised you at all. Like a, a lot of people um, think of indigenous peoples as so rooted in place and tradition and so on that they don't have that sort of consciousness uh, beyond themselves. But this is really like a, a global uh, struggle. Like, um, it's obviously uh, um, alluded to in it um, um, uh, by virtue of, of uh, the corporations that are involved and so on. But, like, I was wondering if, if it opened, opened um, your eyes to how, how important um, or just how global the, the efforts were of the, of the 1970s and into the 80s. Yeah, I think I think you can you can um, talk about the indigenous struggles in the Northwest Territories completely in terms of uh, movements that came out after World War II of decolonizing movements, some of them quite militant. And it was clear to me that uh, people like Jim Antoine, who also became a premier of the Northwest Territory, and Stephen Kakfui, um, were had had their eyes on what was going on in the United States with AIM and also other struggles. I mean, uh, Stephen talked about uh, the Palestinian struggle and how they would look, they seemed to look at a lot of things that were going on around the world and they felt there was common, there was a certain common cause or that they weren't alone in their struggles and I think they, they began to see relationships between what they were doing and what other people were doing. And um, Basically, if other people are struggling for their land, well, let's do it here too. I mean, it, I, think, it, I think it's true in a, in a lot of cases where you're inspired by what other people are attempting or can do. And I think definitely uh, that's true up there. 
Yeah, like I was talking uh, with you uh, earlier about, um, like a lot of a lot of the impetus for the land claims at that point in time, um, and its emphasis on self-reliance was a political economic critique of the relationship between capitalism and and colonialism, and its inspiration was was uh, Tanzania at the time, who which was also inspired by. Um, by the the role of the PRC in, in anti-colonial struggles at the time, so these are these are um, people who, like um, Paul Andrew, are in one one respect rooted. Um, they have one foot out on the land and in community, but at, in another respect, they're they're pouring through the pages of the Communist Manifesto or or <laughs> reading uh, reading uh, Mao's Little Red Book, uh, trying to make. Uh, or not trying to, but making these these deep seated uh, connections across time and time and place. Yeah, I remember uh, talking to Paul Andrew, and he was talking about how people have internalized um, th they've internalized um, the the way the West portrays them. Uh, they've otherized themselves in a certain sense. And he was talking about what was going on in South Africa and how they had learned. Um, that internalizing those sorts of things is where it's it's just that's what you have to fight. That's incredibly important. And and other things he said later on after I got back, I read. I mean, I hadn't read it before, but I read Franz Fanon, and I was thinking this sounds exactly like Franz Fanon. And I don't know if Paul Andrew read Franz Fanon or is this is something his own analysis of it. But clearly, people are engaged with these ideas. You know. Yeah, Fanon was a was a, an important figure. There's um, there's an elder from um, the Daicho region. I don't think you talked to him, and but his name is Sam Gargan. Do you yeah. come across him? He's from Providence. Uh, he was at my cabin like uh, last year sometime, and he was looking at the bookshelf that I have, and it's uh, David Macy's. Uh, um, uh, really big biography of, uh, biography of Fanon, but Fanon's face is on on the uh, the uh, the side of the book, and he's like, "Who's that?" And like out of all of the books in this bookshelf, he's like, "I know that guy," <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, you would have, you would, you 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 do know it, um, and you would have been pouring over the these these pages back back in the day." And he's like, "Oh yes, of course." So um, again, the linking the global with the local is is super important, and I think that it comes out well in your book. Um, I wanted to talk or get your thoughts on the gendered sort of politics of um, of what you portray in the book, um, like as in like as a scholar of of anti colonial movements or or indigenous politics, we know that. Um, that uh, colonialism and dispossession and the violence of residential schools asymmetrically um, um, impacts uh, different people um, in our communities differently. And I was wondering if you, if you, um, if you found that that was something that people would talk about, or you found that that was something that would in, that informed your your study based on who who spoke up who uh, who um, th the, his the like the the history of the, the struggles and and whose voice was represented in uh, in in that history well you know i don't have um, a very academic background in a way so i mean journalistically speaking it's what i see and what i kind of feel and the thing that struck me the most when I was up there is I would go into a band office and uh, talk to talk to the chief. And I would talk to the chief who is generally a male. I mean, it's not exclusively men who are chiefs up, up there, but generally the ones I talked to, I mean, they were all male. Um, but everyone running, running the office was a female. Everyone doing the the work sort of was, was female. And I began to sort of wonder why, why men weren't involved in a lot of it, or why younger men weren't involved. And to be honest, I never really understood it completely. Um, 
but I didn't see many younger men engaged in the day-to-day -day running of the offices. I did speak to one, one woman uh, named Rhea Lecter in Fort Simpson who talked about the gender politics that, that she, she was running for uh, Grand Chief, I think, and she said the main reason she felt like she didn't get it, it's like a good old boys network in a lot of ways. Um, and as a, as a, as a woman, a, a young mother, uh, she was not really, she was sort of excluded for those reasons. And she was, she talked about the, the gender, uh, the gender thing going on there um, and how she felt like uh, they had to move beyond that and have newer people with different ideas. But then again, you know, and then in, in, in uh, Trout Lake, uh, Dolphus Jumbo, who's like a, a great, really lovely chief, or just like really gentleman with a lot of, I, I, I really liked him a lot. Um, his daughter, Jessica, is um, really smart as a whip, and she would like to be chief, but he sort of doesn't want it, even though he doesn't know who can be the chief after him. So I noticed those, I definitely noticed those things, but definitely not from maybe an academic background. I think like, um, like it, it's like all the reasons are within the pages of the book that you wrote, like the residential schools had a very sort of um, ingrained patriarchal sort of violence involved in them, or uh, like involved in their operation. Um, the Indian Act is also a very sexist uh, piece of legislation, which um, has, has shaped um, the subjectivities of indigenous peoples in certain sort of ways. But I, I like, again, how you start um, with your Paul Andrew um, kind of um, reflecting or uh, on, on um, his life on the land growing up. And he explicitly states in, in there that, that, that uh, gender roles, um, there weren't the kind of beaten into uh, patriarchal gender roles uh, back in the day because you had to know everything yeah. when, you were, you, when you were on the land. Uh, you had to know how to sew, you had to, like all these stereotypically like male versus uh, um, female um, types of activities um, just, just wouldn't hold up um, on the land. Yeah, he's, he yeah, specifically said um, there was no such things as, as so-called women's roles. And um, I mean, something else that came out um, from being up there is how once, because there's the residential schools and then there are the, the, schools, the schools that were put in place in the hamlets and villages. And you know, there are laws against not sending your kids to school, so people gathered, people were sort of ingathered uh, in these communities and that sort of, uh, there was there's a ethnologist named Peter Redver, as I talked to, and he said that was a cut in the gender role. It, it, it sort of made a, a difference in how gender worked there because um, when, when there was the hunting would go on, when people lived on the land, everyone went out. Uh, men might have done most of the, the heavy hunting, but everyone went out on the land and once people were in communities, they would still, the men would still go out to hunt, but then the women would stay home, home with the, the kids. It just sort of cut off this whole community a group going out to do these activities. Yeah, and like um, social reproduction is what the academics <laughs> would okay. call it, whereas like uh, when we're looking at um, something in a political economy of a hunting society, um, patriarchal assumptions would have us assume that the kill is, is where, where most of, of the work goes into the reproduction of that society is through that, uh, that moment when you kill an animal. But, but if you look at the labor that goes into, uh, into it on a macro scale, um, it, it's far more equitable, if not central, in terms of, in terms of the, the work of, of women. So, um, paying the land. Uh, could you explain um, the, the title of the book? Yeah, that's, that's one of those titles that when uh, Frederick Andrew told me that story, he's, he's a guy who lives up in Toledo. Um, he was telling a story about going, just 
going into the bush and um, when he goes before he leave, before he begins doing anything, before he puts up his tent, uh, before he does any digging or anything like this, he, um, he gives a gift to the land. It's a, a bullet, a tea bag. It's something small, but it's like a, it's like a very meaningful ritual small but very meaningful ritual, and it's basically um, bringing something to the land before you, you uh, start working on the land. And I thought that was the most, th there's a whole philosophy encompassed in, in that very thing because it really speaks to sort of the reciprocal nature people have with the land, how the land is really something that um, you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. It's very non-Western. It was very foreign and really beautiful, I thought. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, a whole philosophy is built around that, you know, and that, the title really sort of uh, makes that clear. And at, at the end of the book, I mean, I, I don't want to spoil the ending of the book in a way, but uh, in Yellowknife, there's a, there's a, a mine called the Giant Mine, um, a gold mine. I mean, Yellowknife basically, the Western part of it is, is basically grew up in the 30s when, when they were uh, mining for gold. And you might know it's one of the most toxic sites in, in the world. And they have all this, uh, what's it called, arsenic trioxide dust. And uh, they produce a lot of this to, to get gold out of the ore. You, you have to do this process. And the, the, ox the trioxide dust, uh, oxide dust is extremely hazardous. A little bit can kill a lot of people. And they, they generated like 235,000 tons of this stuff. And so where do they put it? They put it down the disused mine shafts of the mine. And I thought that was such a good way of showing the Western way of paying the land. You know, it's like you pay it with arsenic. And uh, in, in great contrast to uh, this sort of, sort of reverence uh, of the land that uh, I saw with indigenous people. Yeah, giant giant mine is uh, right in the heart of our traditional territory. Um, so if you were to um, if you were to distribute every um, every bit of arsenic um, to every person on the world or in the world, um, you, you would kill everybody twice. Is how um, how toxic uh, the surrounding is. And then, of course, with climate change. Um, they're having a hard time uh, finding, like originally it was supposed to be buried into the, into the ground, assuming that permafrost would be around uh, forever, but, but now it's, um, now they're, they're struggling to find what to, do, what to do with all that shit that they've, they've uh, uh, paid, the, <laughs> paid the land with. So, um, and the, la the land will pay you back with interest. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, were there was there any leakage into the water table because that was a real that was a real worry. Uh, yeah, um, it depends on the flow of uh, um, Willowday or Yellowknife River. So it kind of like the current keeps a lot of the toxins um, within Yellowknife Bay, and then and then it's cleaner uh, cleaner on the other side. But um, but in, in and around Yellowknife, you can you can look at the uh, what the lake safety sort of um, um, maps, and it tells you it tells you uh, how clean or or not clean, or or whether or not you just avoid this this space entirely, or uh, or if it's it's safe to travel on or 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 harvest from. Um, yeah, it's 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 a. Uh, um, it's a it's a nasty nasty uh, site. Probably one of the most toxic places in the world. Um, let me think. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I like I think the best parts of the book. Like I like I know the history and, and stuff like that. But it was the it was the story. So it was like um, it was the the conversations that you had um, with Andrew um, or his brother um, Frederick. So maybe share a Frederick story because uh, I've worked with Frederick uh, in my role at the Chinta uh, across from Toledo and he's uh, like an absolutely beautiful man. 
Um, so what, what have you learned from Fred? Well, I mean, you know, okay, I'll tell you something. Um, um, I'll tell you a Frederick story that's not in the book. Um, when we got up to Toledo, uh, Frederick was one of the first people I talked to that was really a, lived a, he, he lived very close to a traditional life. He spent a lot of time on the land, let's say that. Um, and I, we, went, we went to his house and uh, he invited us in and um, his first question to me was, because we, we drove up the winter road and it took, a, it took us a while. We were driving relatively slow and carefully. It took three days to get up. But he asked, what did you think of the drive? And being a Namby Pamby guy from Oregon who doesn't get out, out of the house much, I said, oh man, it was really terrifying. It was just like, I was like really scared half the way. And he was looking at me like, it, was, it, it wasn't beautiful. And I go, oh. Because <laughs> it's just the way I, you know, I mean, I, I learned a lot about myself, unfortunately, <laughs> as he did. So... Uh, it was death at every corner, man. <laughs> yeah. But no, he, his, his father, Frederick Sr., had uh, helped, uh, I think, when, when they were trying to figure out a, a pipeline to going from Alaska to the Northwest Territories during the war, had, with his dog sled, had gone out to sort of survey some territory. And uh, a mountain is named after him. But his father, who was really a traditional person, took Frederick aside at some point and said... We've had stories from the past that told us that at some point the white man will, will come and you'll have to l listen to their, what they have to tell you. You're going to be working with machines one day. And, you know, Frederick went to work with uh, an oil company like a lot of people did. Those were the, once you got into wage labor, that's, those were the jobs. Yeah, in the north, um, like unlike in eastern parts of Canada, the the process of colonization has has been relatively relatively recent. Like it really accelerated after World War II, and what happened was, um, and we were chatting about this before, is the pro the the price of uh, trade goods um, went up, and the and the cost of or the price of furs went down. So it created this this uh, necessity that that uh, native uh, folks, particularly Dene, enter into the capitalist wage uh, system in order to support that which you talk about, um, which, is, which is a life on the land. And, um, and that's kind of the, one of the coercive means by which, um, by which the North is still, this is still governed is, is through that, that um, the expense and and whatnot of of uh, of living a life on the land, and then and then this myth of it it uh, um, the only the only way forward is is through extraction. So, um, what what um, what's what's next on your your to do list? Okay, I'm getting back to the old-fashioned violence. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm doing a book about, it's called A Riot. A riot in India that took place in 2013 in Uttar Pradesh in a uh, place called Mutsafanaga. I mean, the, the bigger themes of the, of the um, story are, are about how violence and democracy are intertwined. Um, I mean, clearly in a place like India, but now it's clear also in a place like the United States. Uh, it's also about narratives people tell themselves about something that happened in their village that was quite violent, stories that are made up, um, the myth-making sort of in real time. So, the usual fun stuff. <laughs> um, are there any regrets that you have about or are things that you would do differently now that you've had, uh, like, uh, in retrospect or some time to sit on, on the text? Um, and this can be um, in general. Like, do you ever have this, these anxi the anxiety that comes now that this thing's in the world? Um, and if it's any different, um, 
um, working with, with Indigenous uh, peoples that were kind of close to home, um, the demands of representing um, them uh, or us in, in ways that don't, don't recreate harms rather than, than, uh, than just, just tell an important, important historical story. Yeah, that was a worry. Um, what, what I did, for example, I, I sent that the story of Paul Andrew, which seemed like a very personal story of him talking about life in the bush with his family. I sent those pages to him. I mean, I did a fair amount of research in um, the Yellowknife archives for photographic reference. I, I scoured YouTube for to find uh, uh, video of people building a moose skin boat so I could sort of know how to draw that. Uh, but I, I ended up sending those pages to Paul and a few other people in uh, Toledo so they'd look, they could look them over. I was also worried about telling a mythological story. I, at, at some point I tell a mythological story and I actually draw it and I wanted to make sure that was okay. But everyone seemed pretty okay with it. Was that the Amazon story? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. No, that's cool. I was a little, I was a little troubled by it, but uh, um, there's a... There's always things I could have pushed further. I could have learned more. I could have I could have visited other places, but at some point you just have to kind of wrap it up and uh, say you you pretty much got I, what you think is um, a, a good a good book. But then you always you always wait for people to tell you what you didn't know. And one of the things, okay, this is what I regret because I actually had a, a a zoom with a bunch of the people I, that are depicted in in uh, Toledo. Um, and they were they liked the book a lot, but one of them one of them said, you know, you really didn't talk about the Métis, and Métis and and uh, Dene problems are essentially the same. And he felt like it, the Métis side of things wasn't really represented in the book. And I thought, yep, that's true. So there you go. Who said that? I can't remember. I, I can't remember. <laughs> uh oh, why, why is there a is there a beef? Okay, I, I think I think it was actually from maybe Fort Good Hope, but mm. I'm trying to remember who it was now. I can't. remember. Rick Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never met this person up there, so uh, he was just in on the um, call and kidding. mentioned it. <laughs> um, I think we're running out of time here, and we wanted to give uh, an opportunity um, for the audience to ask any questions um, of Joe, either of, of this work in particular, what he learned. Um, but but um, I think it's pretty much pretty much fair game uh, in terms of uh, all of all of what you've produced. So so I am going to. Uh, do you want me to moderate? Yeah. Okay. Where was the hand? Hi, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation. Um, I had a question about. Um, representing the violence of the violence of the land as maybe being a shift in some of your work from really human-centered stories. Of course, it sounds like a lot is of capturing the stories and history that you learned through these conversations with individuals. But I'm curious, maybe especially with some of the aesthetics that you were thinking about and how perhaps there was a shift in terms of telling this story, which is a, was or at least started as a story of climate change and of of the land and how that was different from drawing AK 47s Well, that's a good question, actually. Um, land is, serial, is clearly so central in, to the way I think uh, the Dene define themselves that I realized that land was a character in the book. And so I wanted to be really, I really wanted to sort of put effort into drawing things like trees and animals and Try, you know, in my own way, let's say, echo the the reverence the people I met had for the land in, in the drawings, and just to think of the land it's as a living thing, basically. If I could just pass it over, I was just, could we get more specific about what put effort looked like in the case of this book, putting effort into those drawings out of curiosity. Um, like, is that time? Is that looking at other people's drawings? Or who mm. did you go to to, like, gather the technical capacity, potentially, to draw certain landscapes? And Well, I mean, 
having been up there, it's like I took photographs and things like that. But, but uh, okay, an example is um, Paul Andrew was talking about uh, birch tre taking birch trees to make um, the moose skin boat and picking them. And then I was looking up birch trees to see how to draw them, and I realized, oh, there's a couple of them that are pretty predominant up there. So I got in contact with him. I wrote to him and said, which one was it? And he, he told me. So, and then, you know, the fish, the fish they talk about in Trout Lake, uh, the various kinds of fish. So obviously try to research that. Try to draw things realistically on that level, you know. And to me, I, I love, it was really, that drawing landscapes is kind of a pleasure. Uh, so I enjoyed that. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a great struggle. It takes time to draw a lot of trees in the background, but um, drawing it wasn't, a, it wasn't an emotional struggle like drawing other things can be. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a question about your process because so much of your work is so beautifully detailed and, and so much of the emotional quality of it seems to reside in the, the, the drawing itself and the representation of people in this very um, present kind of way. And, and, and um, I just wonder, how do you actually capture the scenes and the people and the situation? Like, do you draw in the moment? Um, I'm not just thinking about this book, but some of the other books that you've made. Like, like how much do you do uh, drawing as you go? How much do you do kind of afterwards recreating from memory? photographs like I'm just curious about because that's such a critical part of the work is the kind of the encounter with the images and the and the detail and the kind of truth telling that's in the images so um I, I find that amazing and I'm just curious how you do it basically yeah well I mean I know other cartoonists who work in in the comics journalism world and everyone has a different way of doing things and I'm not much of a sketcher so I, I actually studied journalism, so I'm really trained to talk to people, <laughs> and I really enjoy talking, talking to people, so I really concentrate on people when I'm talking to them, and then ask to take a picture if they'll let me take a picture. And so I work from those photographs. Often knowing I'm gonna draw people at their table, I try to take the photograph in a way that gives me some idea of just the immediate surroundings. Um, the landscapes, yeah, I took pictures, but there were sometimes I would, I do have sketches, because you know, there were long drives of different kind of trees. I would try to draw, because you see them periodically, the, the same kind of tree, I'd, I'd try to draw uh, those trees as I, as you know, from the road, as we were going by. Um, but, and then I keep a very rigorous journal when I'm traveling, and often the, I, I remind myself of what, of what I need to draw in the journal. I like, I will remind myself of things that are really uh, always present that you might not remember when you're actually drawing a couple of years down the road. So between these sorts of techniques and then a lot of archival, a lot of archival information. Like I'd really tried to draw Fort Good Hope as Fort Good Hope was in the 60s. I tried to draw every single residential school, the exact one that people were at, mm -hmm. you know. I would, imagine, I would imagine that the archive was quite a good uh, source of information for you, especially during like, um, like you have all the Berger Inquiry archives, you have thousands and thousands of, uh, of photos. Um, did you find that as like a particularly uh, fruitful avenue, um, or oh yeah, yeah. I mean, amazingly, I mean the the Berger Inquiry stuff is all all all, all the transcripts are online, so I could directly <coughs> quote what people were saying, um, who were mentioned in the book, what they said in 1975 or 76 or whenever it was, and uh, the Yellowknife Archive is online, and you know, thank God for the keyword concept because you put in sled and you're going to get a lot of hits and you know. Uh, or a name of a community and you'd get a lot of really interesting photographs. I spent a lot of time just going one after another through the photographs, looking for something that would work. How was your conversation with Rene Fumalo? It was a good conversation, but I think at that point, Rene was pretty old 
and um, he probably couldn't express himself as well as he might have maybe five years before, but he was still sort of very good about describing. He still remembered um, working as a priest um, and and his experience with the communities pretty well. Like those things had really stuck in his memory quite well. Yeah, Rene Fumala was an important Catholic priest um, who it, I, I almost want to say was almost like a quasi-liberation theology work that they were doing with the Indian Brotherhood back in the day. And um, and he uh, wrote, as you had mentioned in your uh, text, the definitive um, history of Treaty 8 and 11, which, which um, the Indian Brotherhood used as kind of as uh, the the research to to back their claims in the in the 1970s. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for your book, and um, I'm enjoying this conversation. And but I have a general question because as you were talking, I went, I, I thought, well, you're a good person to ask, and this venue is a good place to ask. We're in the act of reconciliation, and which is reconciling opposites or uh, understanding relationships, I suppose, and you're, that's what you're all about. What does reconciliation mean to do to you, and how do we do it? I don't know if I'd do any reconciling. I mean, I think reconciliation has its place, but it can't be sort of used as a way of tying things up in a bow and saying, well, now the past is the past. And um, that happened before, you know, because certain things are still ongoing. I, I think it's, it, it was like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think it was valuable as a, um, for archival educational reasons. I'm not 100% clear how good it was for the people who are actually telling their stories. It might have been quite dif difficult for a lot of people, but, um, you know, you, you can't just sort of say, well, okay, now we've, we've told the last story, the microphones are turned off, and what's done is done, we're really sorry, here's a check, and that's it. Because actually, I mean, what I, what I learned, because of the land claims, uh, things that are still going on, it, it's clear that a colonial mindset still pervades in the government of Canada. And um, it's things, some things are ongoing. So I, as long as reconciliation is not a cover for something else, you know, I'm all for it. Thank you. I assume you draw very fast. I'm wondering, I've got two, two quick questions. One is how long did it take you to draw it all up reasonably? And then uh, how do you decide how to deploy an anecdote on a page? So like, Dividing up the page, just a quick tip for a beginner. Okay, um, it, it takes about, it took about three and a half years to do. Um, yeah, page design is, is pretty important. And what I normally do is put the left hand side and the right hand side in front of me. So, because I know, to me, I think of the book as something that you open and you kind of, the eye sort of travels everywhere. So, if I'm going to draw some big scene, uh, with a lot of people in it on one side of the page. I don't have to draw that same kind of scene on the other side because it's just visually it's there. It's strange what I do. All the captions, um, I, I write out all the captions and all the word balloons and that's where I start. I place them on the page how I want the eye to travel and then I, I design the drawings around where the words are. So it's, I don't do the drawing first. I actually put the words down first. I'm actually very word oriented. So um, I, I think of that as extremely essential, where they're placed on the page, how you can use, how a drawing should be a, maybe a counterpoint to what's being said or an emphasis or whatever it is. I was, I was actually curious about that because okay. it really did, like, if you were constructing a certain flow. I want to lead the eye, just lead the eye, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for writing the book as well as the other books. And now you're going to to India. My question is, how, how do you compare your experience working with the indigenous people in Canada with the people in India? Because 
I assume a lot of people in India may not speak English. And, and, and how do you communicate? Uh, so that if the difference is in the areas you worked for different books and, and the communication or interpretation or translation. Well, I've learned over time that it's really essential to have someone who can introduce you. So with, it, it was Shauna Morgan, who's a white person, but had a lot of good contacts with indigenous people. Um, just showing up in a place without an introduction is just not a wise idea. Uh, any, I've learned in almost any place. Now in India, um, I'd already worked with a journalist in India. We did a story about uh, poverty in the rural areas of Kushinagar in Uttar Pradesh. So we, some years later, we worked again together. Um, absolutely essential, because I'm, I'm speaking to almost everyone in, in, he was speaking to almost everyone in Hindi, and that was being translated to me. Now, some people speak English, like people in government positions, uh, some lawyers will speak some English, but yeah, you need that. And because Uttar Pradesh is a very big state, he was in Lucknow, which is the capital, and he had helped out local journalists in these very remote areas in the past, so he was always calling people up and saying, time to return the favor. And so we would go out to these places, and, and uh, we always had, it was, uh, my friend Piyush, and then maybe another local journalist who, who knew the place even more intimately. So you try to get, you try to really talk to the people who can get you access and who, who can sort of steer you in the right direction. And there's a, there's a fair amount of trust with that that's involved. Just a second. So how do you choose the area in India? It's such a huge country. In terms of whether you had ever thought of writing about riots in Gujarat, for example. Well, you know, Gujarat, there's a, as people probably here know, that Gujarat was a very huge riot uh, with, with thousands of people lost their lives. But what was interesting to me about Mutsafanaga was that by, let's uh, forgive me, but by Indian standards, it was a very small riot in a very small area and unusual in that it was mostly a rural riot, as opposed to in the cities. And in a riot over a small area, uh, I could talk to a lot of the main people involved. And it was, it's sort of a, a template in a way. It wasn't a big riot by Indian standards. Maybe officially 60 people died, and maybe 50,000 people were displaced. But to me it's, it's, um, the, the, the book is called The Once and Future Riot because it's, it, every riot kind of resembles the one before it. Or that's how I, how I look at it. It was a bite-sized riot. Yeah. You have, um, I was just thinking about this, but of course Paul Andrews, uh, like, a, like a broadcaster, has thought, like that's what his career was. And I noticed a connection with him in particular in the text, is that, did you shoot the shit over <laughs> no, the professional stuff? No, not at all. I mean, he didn't tell me he was doing any stuff for the CBC uh, radio until we were almost at the end of our, he never, that wasn't part of the conversation for him. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks for being here. Um, your book, uh, Pangolin, it, it became the center of a pretty hot debate in the class that I was in. Um, specifically in the context of uh, the instructor posed us the question, uh, let's think about this book with regard to non-Indigenous people telling Indigenous stories. And, um, and I was saying, you know, well, Paying the Land is a, an example of Sacco doing a really good job of this. Um, and, uh, and, but I had to start thinking about your presence in the text when I was answering this, these questions. Um, and obviously, like, how you inhabit space in the text is a, you know, really interesting. Uh, you know, you're, you're very cartoonish. Um, and, and you don't take up that much space. Um, but one of the most interesting details I, I personally that I came across was um, that you don't have any eyes in the text. Um, you, you, like Paul Andrew, he has glasses, of course, but you can see his eyes along with a whole cast of other characters. 
um, but but you don't. And um, and I've I've speculated at uh, length about why this might be um, <laughs> on like three different papers now. <laughs> and um, and so I'm I'm really interested to hear straight from your mouth why um like was there was that a conscious decision? Um, did you put thought into that? Is that just sort of a byproduct of you cartooning yourself more than you cartooned other real life characters? Well, unfortunately for you, it was a conscious decision, but I've forgotten why. <laughs> I mean, okay. Um, because you're showing some part, of, every, every part of myself that I show is true in its essence, but you don't see everything that I'm thinking and everything I'm feeling, and it's sort of a clue to the reader that you're not seeing, because you know, the eyes are the window to the soul. And now I've, I've, people ask this question, and every time I answer it, I said, well, well, what a pretentious prick. You know? So I, I almost want to get rid of that trope, but it, it becomes, it's like my cape, right? My Superman cape, it's my no eyes. It's, it's, it becomes sort of a shorthand for my drawing, which, um, you know, so it's, it's not a big substantial reason, I'm afraid. So don't write any more papers about it. <laughs> the reason you gave is exactly the reason that I was speculating okay. about. Okay, great. Just a minute. I come from a large family and my Punjabi nephews and nieces and myself included have enjoyed your work for many years. They've tried to trace your drawings and MC them like on their walls. They're mainly from Edmonton and Toronto, but when I visit. So I was, um, and it's not the first time, but I was uncomfortable, a little saddened to see your name right beside Gold Corp. And obviously this is the building that we're in is Gold Corp. Not here, but the press release in a couple of places. They were smart enough not to put your name in Gold Corp up here. And, um, and of course, I was thinking you're coming into this building and I was really thinking, great, 15% or 20% of this talk is gonna be about Gold Corp because Gold Corp has been running people off of their land, indigenous land, all through the global south and possibly even in Canada. And it really just functions as this kind of elephant in the room. And every year when Gold Corp has their stockholder meeting in Toronto, there's like hundreds of protesters outside. So I'm just wondering, like there's three of you that were on stage earlier and even the audience, all the questions, we haven't really tackled Gold Corp. So anything you want to say about Gold Corp, why you didn't mention it, I would really appreciate it. And I look forward to your next book. Thank you. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, that's, it's a good question. Um, the truth of it is, I can't say I know that much about that specific company. I know it's involved in some of the things you're talking about. And uh, I probably have to educate myself more about it. I mean, that's, that's all I can tell you. But, I mean, I think you make a very fair point. And yourself, Harvey? The... I have answered this question a number of times. I've actually, every time that I think I've, I've spoken in here. And it's just about, like, um, it's about using um, a space uh, against its, itself. Like, uh, I've been... Uh, to an incredible amount of critical, um, even radical interventions that have that have happened to this space was it, it happened in this space, and um, and I'm yeah I'm I I I recognize uh, Gold Corp as a human rights obliterator um, across across uh, uh, the globe, uh, but but. Um, the work that I do, the work that is embodied in in, in Joe's uh, Joe's journalism and his uh, and this this uh, book in particular, I think uh, stands uh, stands on its own, and I don't think that it's um, uh, necessarily co-optable um, in in the sense that. The Gold Corp's not going to be um, going around uh, patting itself on the back, saying that uh, Glenn and, and Joe had a conversation in, in this in, in this space. So, thank you very much. I just wanted to say thank you to Glenn and Joe.
Ja.